So we rewind to the last checkpoint. Um, so I'm Christoph Pettis with PostgreSQL Experts. We are a boutique Postgres consultancy based in the Bay Area. You may have heard about us somewhere before, like really recently. Um, <laughs> The, uh, that's my technical blog. <laughs> I'll, I'll be done teasing the audio people in a moment. I've done this lots of times. Um, anyone like me who's RMRF'd an entire database has no reason to complain about technical issues. Um, <laughs> there's the um, not for a client. Um, the, there, and there's my Twitter account. So what are we going to talk about here? Um, Postgres can handle databases of any size. Largest community Postgres uh, database that I personally have worked on was multiple petabytes. No sharding, no nothing. There weren't even partition tables. So, but as Postgres databases grow, you do need to do things. You can't just like dump the community install in there and watch it grow to a, a few petabytes and say, see, problem solved. Um, you know, what works for one gigabyte database doesn't work for a 10 terabyte database. So what we're going to talk about is what goes wrong and what we do. So let's talk about that. Again, technical blog. Uh, the, this, the, slides, the slides will be up there for in, in answer to the, the one, que the, sometimes the only question I get on a talk. So, you know, we have database sizes all the way down from teeny little red dwarfs up to way to, you know, blue super giants. So we're going to use this as our um, model for database sizes. So ten, you know, you you do your app get install and you install your little database and it's it, and and it's tiny and for tiny I'll say under ten gigabytes is tiny. So it's your brand new little database. It's hard to go wrong here. You you know you really have to go out of your way to misconfigure a database of this size. Um, nearly everything will run fast, which is a big danger because as things grow, they'll stop running fast, and you can kind of get lured into a false sense of security on small databases, especially when you're testing. Um, even these weird pathological joins, um, you know, these 23-page joins that people love to write, which have to be run every time someone refreshes the home page, um, naming no names. You know, unless they manage to do a cross-join, which I've seen, um, it'll run fast, because small database, everything's in memory. Um, you can even just use the stock postgresql.com, you know, it'll be fine. So how much memory do you need for a database like that? Well, if you have a 10 gigabyte database that's running in production for a system that someone cares about and you can't figure, fit it in memory, reconsider your life choices. I mean, 10 gigabytes, come on, you know. All right, my laptop doesn't have that, but any production system should. Um, you know, even small micro instances from your whatever vendor you care to uh, obtain your database systems from, Will could handle things of this size. So entire database will can fit in memory. So even sequential scans at this point will pretty much zip right along. So how do you back up a database of this size? Just use PG dump. I mean, really no reason not to at this point. It'll move, it'll, um, you know, on, on this set, this a five gigabyte PG dump takes 90 seconds. That's probably sufficient. You don't really need anything more sophisticated at this point. And you know, stick the, file, the backup files in cloud storage, you know, S3 or B2 or whatever, and you're done. So high availability, because even on small databases, this could be mission critical, this could be business critical. You may still want to have it around. Um, just have a primary and a secondary. Um, use either direct streaming or basic wall archiving or both. Um, manual failover, really cheap and easy. You know, at a database this size, just where the, you know, get the phone ping, come up, you know, sleepily push the button and fail over. How do you tune a database on this scale? Well, if you, if you must, um, you know. Um, just the usual memory related parameters are fine. Um, there are a couple specialized parameters, you know, for all in memory. Um, but at this stage, you can really just keep it simple. Don't go crazy. I mean, the, one of the problems with PostgreSQL.com is people look, pop open and their first reaction is, we are going to die. There's you know, 700,000 parameters in here, and if I get one wrong, everything will melt down. And the answer is, well, no. It's actually much easier than that. Um, actually, this um, for an entirely in-memory database, I've had good success with these parameters. So you know, experiment with them. Um, shared buffers to the traditional 25% of memory. Um, I did an experiment, actually, where I set shared buffers in, in half gigabyte instances from one to 127 gigabytes on a machine of that size and could measure almost no performance difference. So I'm, I'm starting to lose my deep religious faith that shared buffers is a super t sensitive setting. Um, 
you know, work mem, 16 megabytes, maintenance work mem, so start there. Um, this is kind of like when people ask me, so what should I do? You know, tur turn, on, uh, um, have, turn on a fair amount of logging, you know, set min statement duration size to taste, depending on how much log volume you really can deal with. Um, this is assuming you're not on RDS, at which point some of these are forced upon you. Um, but, and at this point, you're kind of done with tuning. That wasn't too hard. Um, at this point, to do upgrade to new major releases, just do a dump and restore. You know, you're talking about two minutes of downtime. That's probably acceptable. Um, and you're done. So that's easy. But do it. One of the things that gets people into trouble is they kind of, every time they look at doing a major version upgrade, they look at it and say, well, maybe tomorrow. And then suddenly, um, and as they, as they go farther and farther behind on major versions, it becomes more intimidating and harder, and they're more worried about planner changes, and they're more worried about everything. It's very important, even at this tiny little database size, to sort of commit to an upgrade strategy. Understand that you'll need to take some downtime, that you'll need to do it. Because otherwise, you end up being the, um, the client who is running a, a petabyte size database on 8.1. And you know, the, now and, and are coming to us saying, so how do we upgrade this? So there's this awkward moment of silence on the phone. Um, so just you know, get into the habit. Make it part of your life. OK, so we're, we're still on the main sequence here of stars, at least. And 100 gigabytes. This isn't you know, what I call a huge database, but it's starting to get better, bigger than it'll fit into memory, which is kind of like the first threshold you, you walk through in dealing with Postgres. It's like suddenly you can't really just keep everything in memory. Um, so queries might start performing poorly. Things that worked great on your 10 gigabyte database are now starting to, um, to grind to a halt. Um, you, this, the advice I gave you previously about dump and restore starts becoming bad advice because it's taking you too long and your data loss window is starting to get really long. So how much memory do you need for a database this size? Well, this is the number one question I think we're asked about when we're asked to configure uh, instances is, how much memory do I need? And the answer is hard to answer because it depends a lot on your workload and um, the kinds of access patterns you have on the database. So if you can fit the whole thing in memory, great. That's easy. Um, as a rule of thumb, look at your largest indexes and see if you can fit the, the largest one to three. Um, I have kind of this rule that um, it's, it's a good idea to, have effective, to be able to set effective cache size larger than your largest index. Of course, if your largest index is you know, 12 terabytes, this, this advice isn't going to be so great. But that's a, that's a, good, that's a good place to start if you're deciding how, um, how big an instance to get. If you can't, more memory is always better, but just remember, more memory does, uh, does not help write performance. You can't memory your way out of write performance. And that's frequently the first place that a, that a large production system starts falling apart is it's running out of write capacity. So you can't P do PG dumps anymore, so how do you back something like this up? So it's time for to, to commit to PITR backups. Um, I personally like PG backrest a lot. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it <laughs> yes, yes. It it has a really strong advocacy advocacy, advocacy community <laughs> who's sitting there. Um, so, um, yeah, you you can't get away from the you can't get away from the ads for it anymore. Um, but it is a very good tool, and, I, and we like it a lot. Um, you know, Wally's kind of the old warhorse. If you're using it, at least you're doing it. Um, it is you know there there are things that backrest does uh, does that Wally does not. So consider move. Um, moving from one to the other. If you must, you can roll your own. But understand that this is not as easy as it looks. Um, so the, uh, you know, a PITR backup, for, as a quick summary, for people not familiar, takes the entire file system copy plus wall archiving. Um, the more frequently you, copy, you do the file system copies, you get a faster restore. But you're also doing the large copy a lot. Um, PG Backrest does do differential and incremental backup um, copying, which helps. Um, the fact that Postgres uses one gigabyte wall, um, file sizes does not help. Um, the other big benefits are you can restore to a point in time. 
and can use the backup to prime secondary instances. So that's a very nice, those are very nice additional attributes you get pretty much for free for moving to this backup strategy. Yeah? To, no, I don't, yeah. Yeah, and generally like with, like with not so much wall segment, this is my traditional advice on wall segments, although it's less true. You can, even, you can change it, but you will probably at some point crash into a tool that wasn't expecting that change. So you, you need to make sure that this change really is like a huge deal for you before, you know, it's, it, no tool should har have hardwired that wall segments are 16 megabytes and the file segments are one gigabyte, but should is a fascinating term in computing. Um, so tuning, okay, well, you just, you know, play with the numbers. Um, sequential page costs, you know, 0.5 to one. Random page costs, 0.5 to two. Um, if you're running on RDS, just set ra um, random page cost to 1.1 because there's no such thing as sequential access on, on EBS. Um, because it, you're, you're mixing it up with like 5,000 other clients on this giant SAN. So, um, and again, these are not super sensitive parameters. Um, share buffers, maintenance work mem. Um, it's easy to go too high actually on maintenance work mem. Um, because, so, I've actually gotten, um, there are systems that, where I've actually seen index rebuilds and, and vacuuming sped up um, considerably by adjusting it down so the cycle times were faster. So play with it. Um, look at your logs and set work mem based on actual files, that, temporary files that are being created. Um, you can take an initial stab at it, but do look at the logs because it'll tell you, assuming you've turned on log temp files like I encourage you to do a few slides back. Um, so to what you actually want there. Um, you know, set it to two or three times the largest temporary file. Um, you know, the first problem is, of course, well, what if your largest temporary file is 12 gigabytes? At the, the first thing you should do is, well, fix the query. Um, if you can't fix the query, like it's a huge data analysis query, well, buy more memory. Um, if you can't um, get away from these giant temp files, just accept it if it's a low frequency query and the execution times within range or you know start thinking about more memory. So this is around the stage where um, you might consider moving read traffic to streaming replicas. Um, you know, be aware the replication lag is non-zero. So an a, um, a system that is expecting to do an immediate read after write inside of a single transaction may be in for a nasty surprise. Um, Ideally, you should handle the traffic uh, balancing in the app. So have the app understand if it needs to go to a primary or a secondary. Um, you will, your life will be much, much easier if you do it that way as opposed to uh, expecting a front end, a, a middleware layer to route queries for you. Um, if you absolutely can't, if, the, if you have like a very large existing app and rewiring all those queries is going to be impossible, well, PG Pool's there for you. Um, it is kind of interesting and fiddly to set up. There are lots of parameters, but um, it is kind of a quirky tool, but it does exist. So at this point, you kind of want to sign up for real life monitoring also. Um, you know, at an absolute minimum, process your logs through PG Badger. Um, the, the, I, I like to at least once a week or sometimes more frequently, get the PG Badger report and just click over on the events tab. If you do nothing else, and then look at the errors. Because it's amazing how many times we've gotten one of these and said, by the way, are you like doing some kind of optimistic insert into your database? And they said, optimistic insert what? I said, because we saw like 250,000 duplicate key violations, which is fine if you know, the app is doing an optimistic insert and dealing with the optim violation and it doesn't use the you know, on conflict statement. And there was this awkward silence of like, no, we had no idea that was going on. So the, the event, if nothing else, look at the events tab in the PG Badger reports. Um, every PG stat statements is very valuable. It's not zero cost on performance. So be aware that it do, there is a performance. Um, there, it, does, it does suck up some cycles to have PG stat statements installed, but it's very valuable for figuring out which queries are actually um, burning through, burning through much um, in ways that you might not be able to get out of PG Badger because of 
min, <coughs> uh, min statement duration set too low. Um, I like PG Analyze. It's a paid external tool uh, wrapped around it, but the, and there are plenty of others, but I just personally like, like the graphs are pretty, I don't know. Um, you know, everything now has, P has Postgres plugins of various kinds. So, you know, um, pro probably not a, a reason, you know, if you're, um, I like Datadog's Postgres monitoring, for, you know, but all of, you know, New Relic is kind of nice because you do get a full, a, a, a pretty good full stack picture of it. But, and of course, if you already have a monitoring infrastructure for other things, well, drop, make sure Postgres is part of it. So this is also the point that queries are kind of like starting to become problematic. Um, definitely check PG Badger and PG <coughs> stat statements regularly for slower queries. The queries you thought might be slow are not. One thing, um, and um, it's very, and sometimes th these particular queries will pop out at you. Um, this is the point where you're going to start really noticing missing indexes. As a philosophy, I don't like, there, there's a, I come from a Python background, and which means I'm using Python ORMs a lot. And there is this thing of over-indexing databases because it's so easy. You just say DB index equals true and you know, build you an index and everything's fine. And there's, this creates this culture of kind of, opt of, of indexing everything and letting the database sort it out later. Please don't do that. You know, we were bad and wrong to do it that way um, because indexes are very expensive. They're expensive to maintain. They take up a lot of disk space. Um, they can significantly reduce insert time. So only create indexes because they're actually, uh, they're actually necessary. Another thing, um, uh, create, yeah, just don't start slapping indexes on anything. Also something that I encourage people to do is Postgres has a lot of interesting index types and start exploring those a bit more. You know, traditionally you just create a B-tree index and you were done. Um, but for example, if you have a log, uh, a table that's logging events, very common. Um, if you, and you frequently want to do queries on time ranges for those, also very common. At this point in Postgres, maybe don't just slap a B-tree index on the time, but use a Brin index instead. Um, I just did that this morning, in fact, on an index that was just about under a gigabyte, and the Brin index was, 100 and it was 138K. <laughs> and the queries ran faster. So that was like, a, you know, that was a gigabyte of memory I could, you know, could take, take, use a vaca take a vacation with or something, you know. I, so um, definitely, um, similarly, um, <coughs> for large data, t for data, long data types, that especially ones that have lots of entropy kind of near the end, URLs are a great example of this. Consider using a hash index instead of a B-tree index. Um, be, uh, be, of course, with a hash index, you can only do quality comparisons, but presumably you're not querying on ranges of URLs. That would be an interesting challenge thing. But um, so, or um, like large, large varchar types, you often a hash index will have better performance. So, Postgres like has all these wonderful index types. Start checking them out. Um, but more than anything else, base index creation on very specific needs. Okay. Now, at this point, you probably are getting tired of the pager going off. So what are your options here? Um, now it's time to look at tooling for failover. Um, PG Pool 2 does this. Um, I like Petroni. Um, for if, uh, if you're in a cloud environment, Petroni is a nice tool um, for handling failover and instance creation. There are others that are commercial products. Um, this is... As much as I have nuanced feelings about RDS um, and other and similar hosted solutions, this is one area that th this is why people move to them because their failover story is m is very very good, and maybe that's an, a compelling enough reason to move to a, a hosted solution. You do pay a tax, you know, compared to a bare EC2 or whatever instant comp comp compute instance, and you do have limitations there, like. Just right up to this call, I just spent two hours fixing a problem on RDS that probably would have taken me 15 minutes on Community Postgres, but I don't have enough, I can't get at the instance to figure out what was going on. But um, those don't happen very often. You know, that's not a, a routine thing, so maybe hosted solutions are a good idea for you. Upgrades. So at this point, you probably look, want to do, just do PG upgrade. It works very well, it's very reliable. Um, it can do in-place and very low downtime upgrades. You know, we're, we're talking 
half hour range, usually, depending on the database. Um, it's very reliable and well tested. Um, been a long time since I had a serious problem with it. Um, the only concern about PG upgrade that I, is that the um, if, you're, if you, all you use are core Postgres features and things that are in contrib, it's fine. There are no issues to worry about. Third party extensions can be a little bit complicated. Um, if an extension changes name, like a few versions back, um, like um, there was an Oracle uh, library that changed name, and that was, it, all, the, all the functions stayed the same, but the extension itself changed name. That was kind of a pain. Um, and post just could be a problem because the range, Postgres, um, each post just version operates on a relatively narrow range of Postgres versions. So you sometimes have to upgrade PostGIS, then upgrade Postgres, you know, and, and if you're doing a big version jump, you sometimes have to do this ladder of upgrades. <clears throat> okay, but it works, and that's probably at this database size what you're gonna be doing. Okay, and then your database reaches one terabyte. This is kind of where things get real, you know, this is, th this is where you're running a real database with real concerns. You, first of all, you just can't get enough memory. Okay, yes, you can buy, you can get one terabyte worth of memory in a machine. I assume, I assume most, peop most people who are, go are doing that probably don't need this talk. Um, queries are starting to fall apart more regularly. This is where you, where you get really, you can get serious query performance issues. And at this point, you're probably running out of read capacity. Um, and doing a full PITR backup is taking a long time. To sho you know, shoving one terabyte up the link to S3 is not a fast operation no matter where you are. Um, get as much memory as you can afford. So, you, know, the, you, you, know, you, know, you know your budget better than I do. Um, generally, data warehouses need much more than transactional databases because the kind of queries that you're doing on data warehouses can really benefit from the memory. Transactional databases tend to have smaller working sets and, much high, and be more write intensive. Um, this is where IO throughput becomes much more important. Um, so if you're on a hosted solution, you just buy more stuff. If you're on running on more or less bare metal, you start looking at what options are available. Um, this is a place where sometimes we recommend the clients start moving off of EBS. If you're, who's running on Amazon? Just out of curiosity. Okay. Not as many as I expected. That's it. Who's running on RDS in particular? Okay, um, for people who are running on bare EC2, this is often where we recommend that people start consider moving off of EBS and onto like I3 class instances that have high speed local storage because the world, it's, it's a whole different world <laughs> in terms of performance on those it's kind of instances. So that's pretty nice. Um, oh, like I say in the next bullet point. Um, so this is where you have to start doing incremental backups. Um, PG Backrest does them out of the box, very nice. Um, you can roll your own, but this is very much extra for experts. Um, there are lots of gotchas here. So unless you have a very, very specific environment where you need them, trust a, a solution that's been built by people who have already have the scars on their flesh for these problems. <laughs> um, so, no harm in doing these earlier, but this is definitely, you know, by now, please change your checkpoint parameters. Um, we have, uh, it's interesting, I actually dealt with a problem relatively recently where a client was melting down because um, they just upgraded from 9.6 to 10. They were on RDS, not Aurora, but RDS. And their CPU was maxing out. It was just like slammed all the way to the top. And they couldn't figure out why because they hadn't changed anything. What they hadn't actually th remembered to do is do a new parameter group. So they were running on stock checkpoint parameters, and basically the system was continuously checkpointing. It was like every, like it was checkpointing about every 500 milliseconds. So, and that's where all the CPU was going. So, these matter. Um, even this keep shared buffers in that range, larger will increase checkpoint activity without much performance benefit. Um, and don't go crazy with work mem. Interestingly enough, on very, very high write load databases, you frequently have to reduce shared buffers to keep checkpoint size under control. Um, I've had to crank it as low as one gigabyte. So, that, um, so that's something to explore. Don't, don't you know, if, if, especially if checkpoint activity is getting to be really out of control. Um, don't go crazy with work mem. 
if your, in your um, indexes are huge, it's often better to decrease it. You often get better performance out of it. So that's something else to play with. You are definitely going to need load balancing at this point, and read replicas become very important. This is the point where you really need to distinguish a failover candidate, one that stays very close to the primary, um, as opposed to read replicas, which are going to take all, the, all your read traffic, because um, you don't want the, the read replicas can accept the delays, um, while, whereas the primary failover one cannot. Um, and this is also the point that you really want to, that if you're not on a fully hosted solution that does this for you, you want to start looking at config as code ways of spitting up new replicas so that you can, um, you can scale up to anticipate more, um, more write volume and things like that. So this is the time to start investing in that kind of tooling. Um, sometimes for the failover candidate, um, we have, people are interested in using synchronous replication there because you're guaranteed not to lose a transaction that was committed on the primary. That's true, but be aware that that will significantly hurt your write throughput. Um, usually, usually to the point that it's not, um, that turning it on globally is not a practical thing to do. You probably want to start focusing on d distinguishing critical transactions that you really can't lose, the, you know, uh, financial transactions, things like that, depending on your workspace, your business space, um, between ones where really the app could recreate the data if it had to. This is also where you want to start moving analytic queries and things like that off of the primary database, maybe even earlier. Um, this is where you creating logical replicas for analytics and data warehousing can be really super nice. Um, this is also where a lot of services that were really convenient to put in the database to start, maybe it's time to start moving them up, like all those job queues and other things that really don't need to be in the database, but it was there. You know, All the clients connected to it. It was really handy to have them all there. Now maybe it's time to investigate um, actual um, que queuing style databases and things like that. You know, Redis, whatever. Um, everyone's favorite topic, vacuum. Um, this is where vacuums can start taking a long time, especially that, re that very, very first auto vacuum freeze that wakes up out of nowhere and grinds your database to a halt. Um, auto vacuum workers is not the place to start for this tuning because that really only helps you if you have a large number of database objects as opposed to just big tables. Um, it's sort of sad that here it is 2009 and I have to tell people this, but let your vacuum jobs complete. Um, you don't want to get into the coffin corner situation where you've killed your vacuum jobs and killed your vacuum jobs and now you're getting so close to the transaction ID wraparound point that there's no way of getting out of it without a database shutdown. So I understand they're painful. I understand they take a lot of IO. Tune them if you, tune, definitely tune them, but let them finish. Don't just kill them. Um, this also, you know, be careful with long running transactions um, that can block auto vacuum activity. Um, and auto vacuum is great. It's wonderful. Nine tenths of databases, it does a good job. But there's no harm. You know, it, you, 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 it's not an admission of failure if you decide to do manual vacuuming. Um, it it's a very, can be a very valuable tool. Very high update rates where auto vacuum will have trouble keeping up or you want to free the workers for other things. Um, bulk loads, all that kind of stuff. Just be, be um, especially on larger databases, doing manual vacuums can be very useful. Um, if it's, if auto vacuum is taking too long, you can make it more aggressive by reducing auto vacuum, uh, um, auto vacuum vacuum cost delay. That's kind of my first place that I like to tweak that. Um, if it's causing capacity issues, bump it up. Um, and again, let it complete. Even, even if, um, especially if it's a, a um, if it's the to prevent XID wraparound type, by all means, let it complete. So, giant database, so you have giant indexes. Um, start looking at your query loads, and maybe you can get away with doing partial indexes for some of them, rather than um, rather than indexing the all values in the all, all values in all rows, or all all the rows for a particular column. That is, um, this is um, definitely look at what indexes are actually being used. Look at PGStat user indexes and see if there are any that um, that aren't being used, and drop them by now you have enough history to see what, what your query load's actually like. 
Um, queries can start becoming very, very problematic here because even the best query can take a long time against this giant data set. Um, so, you know, this is where index scan queries start turning into bitmap uh, index scan, heap scan, and taking much longer. Um, this is also your database is getting to the size that it's time to investigate partitioning. So, look for tables that could be, uh, benefit from partitioning. Um, now in version 10, we have declarative partitioning, which is a significant step forward and makes partitioning much nicer and easier to use. Um, just remember kind of the rules on partitioning, which is it has to have a, a, a strong partitioning key. That is to say a key which divides the, the, the which when the, time, the, the, the bucketing system is applied, either hash-based or um, time-based, it divides the data in, up into roughly equal buckets it's used in essentially every query against this table. And it is generally invariant once the row is created. Uh, the invariance is not as important as it used to be with 11 because we, you can't, it will move things between partitions on, a cha on partitioning key changes, but you don't want that to be normal operations. And we now have parallel query execution. So, in, this may be where you want to increase the number of, of query workers in the per query parallelism. The defaults are fairly conservative. Um, it's very powerful for things to do large sequential scans or otherwise handle large, um, large result sets. You can get a really big speed up there. Just make sure your I.O. capacity can keep up. There's no point in having, if you're saturating I.O. with three workers, going to six workers is not going to help you a whole lot. And statistics targets. So, um, for fields with a large number of values, the default statistics target can be too low. This is especially problematic for things that, for larger values, um, again, like URLs, UUIDs, things like that. Um, the look for queries where a, uh, where a specific query is planned to return a large number of rows, especially where the, row, the, um, the, the estimates versus the, uh, the actual returns are way out of whack. The, um, you can often get improvement, uh, significant improvement there by increasing the... Um, um, <clears throat> by increasing the statistics target for a column. Just don't go crazy with it because it, um, like don't globally set it to 10,000 because what, this significantly increases analyze time on, that on the table whose columns you've bumped up. So as I mentioned before, a lot of columns aren't great matches for B-tree indexes, long strings, range types, things like that. So use the indexes appropriate for that type. Um, for for things for um, uh, things that increase that you use for queries and monotonically increase with um, with insert order, Brin indexes are great for that kind of thing. Um, and again, hash indexes are very useful for things that have um, are good for strings, especially th where like a lot of the entropy is near the end. Okay, now you have to upgrade this ten terabyte database. A uh, PG upgrade still works fine. Um, the time PG upgrades time is proportional to the number of database objects, not to the not to the database size. Assuming you're running in link mode, it's kind of weird to use PG upgrade when you're not running in link mode. Um, if the downtime on PG upgrade is uh, unacceptable, then it's time to consider doing the upgrade by logical replication and rehoming. We have in-core re logical replication now that um, can handle the problem very nicely. In-core logical replication is actually really fast, also, so it's very nice. Um, just remember it doesn't replicate sequences automatically. So uh, before you bring it back up and all your primary keys on, that are based on serial start breaking. Um, just be sure to plan for major version upgrades lest you be this one petabyte database that's still on 8.1 um, and is still in production. Okay, 10 terabytes. 10 terabytes is big. This is definitely a real database. Um, and this is where you're going to have to start making some decisions about how to handle things. Um, um, if you're backing up a 10 terabyte database, anything that involves copying is going to start becoming impractical now. Because it, it depends on whether or not you can get away with differential, sort of a traditional differential backup. Depends a lot on how frequently you're doing it and, what, and how many tables and are being touched. If a relatively small portion of the database is being touched, it may still be okay. Um, you might consider using file system snapshots at this point. Um, you know, they, they're, there's, they do copy, you know, everything copies, but it, um, <coughs> but it can be less, less impact on the, uh, on the production database. You know, ZFS or sand based snapshots, things like that. Um, table spaces are a pain. 
Um, there's this, uh, you can, uh, can always tell an Oracle, when an Oracle DBA set up a database, because I log in, and it's like a 10, 10 gigabyte database with 12 name spaces, table spaces, because the Oracle style is to create lots and lots of table spaces right up front. Don't do that. Um, only use them for a very specific reason where they get you something you can't get without a table space. Um, for example, your system has fast and slow storage and there's no other way of easily dividing things up between them. You're reaching the limits of a single volume and there's no way to conveniently expand it, things like that. Um, just understand that they do complicate backups and, and replication significantly. For example, all your replicas have to have pretty much exactly the same table space structure, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, indexes can get pretty badly bloated at this size. Um, and they're harder to reclaim than the space in the heap because indexes have structure. So um, this is a point where frequently you want to start thinking about doing re-index and replacement scripts where you actually re-index badly bloated indexes um, or and actually seek out ones that are badly bloated and re-index them and replace them. Um, hmm? Well, there, there are queries floating around. We have one on the PGX site. Uh, pgexperts.com uh, to you know, use your favorite one. Um, everything's an estimate because we, you know, we don't go in and read every every tuple, every, every page in the, to see if it's bloated. But um, rate capacity might start becoming constrained at this point. This is kind of the order of magnitude. Um, you might want to consider sharding. Um, there are, if you want, kind of nothing is truly drop-in sharding, of course. But if you want to consider sharding solutions that are that handle the chart and write distribution for you. There's Citus, Postgres XL, you know, custom-based um, application-based sharding. Um, this is also very valuable because it can accelerate your read side also, uh, assuming your sharding key is a good one. Um, just be prepared because you've just significantly increased your administrative complexity by doing this. Okay, and then beyond this, we get to the, the size which we technically call huge. Um, which are really huge databases, but you have to be com um, make some complex choices. Not everybody can get away with the, well, we have a one petabyte database and we kind of didn't do anything special. It just is. It's amazing it works, but it does. Um, so, and also, if you got to this size, you know, every, um, every large database is large in its own way. Um, the, most, the first thing you need to think of is like, so based on your workload, kind of what's the working set? Um, if most of the, the data is archival, this is how the one petabyte database gets away with it, is because it, it's one petabyte of data with about 85K of working set. It only, it's mostly just a big, big passive data store. Um, so if performance will be manageable if it's archival, but you know, if it's archival, maybe you should archive it. Maybe it doesn't need to actually live inside the Postgres database. Um, this is the point where separating into a transactional and where, a data warehouse is probably a really good idea. Um, there are also, you might, cons um, either kind of cold storage, you know, you take the data, the data out and store it as blobs, or you move it into a, a database system that's um, specifically, like Redshift, any number of them, there's Green Plum, they're specifically designed for this kind of large data volume. Logical replication is great, of course, for this kind of stuff. Um, so, at this point, you might consider large-scale sharding, like geographic or based on geography, based on enterprise, so like a more advanced sharding technique. Um, Multi-master tools, you know, depending on what you, um, what you have available to handle the synchronization here. Um, there's Bucardo, Second Quadrant's BDR, you know, something custom, something that you build, build custom based on, you know, message passing, who knows, lots of things. Um, this is also where data federation can be very handy. You know, f for example, moving things into alternative, alternative data stores. You know, also maybe you need unless you um, maybe if what you need it for is compliance or theoretical recovery rather than continuously updated analytics. Maybe it doesn't need to be an RDBMS at all. Maybe it's fine to store it as blobs and shove it into some kind of uh, long-term cold storage. Um, you can use foreign data wrappers. You have to be careful because foreign data wrappers can do sort of imply that you can get at everything that's mounted by the foreign data wrapper. So they can, they can make your high availability a little bit complicated, but it is a very nice way of wrapping these federated data systems. You know, or just run big and small databases on the same Postgres instance. Okay, so 
Um, Postgres is amazing. Thank you all for coming. Ted, thank you for my, coming to my TED talk. Um, it can handle every, you know, what's, what's cool about it is it's the same database that you install on your laptop that's running these giant databases. So that's really neat. Um, it, it can grow with you. One thing that you do want to do is don't overtool your installation at each phase because you really don't know what you're going to need at the next order of magnitude. You know, learn as you go. Um, don't go, you know, there's, there's so many options for tooling out there right now. There is kind of this thing of everyone wants to uh, crack open the big box of crayons as soon as they've installed Postgres. Learn what, how your particular organization and, and world is going to use this stuff. Um, and just look ahead. So think about, well, as this database grows, what are we going to use? And that's my talk. Thank you so much. There is a question way over there. Well, well what I the slide I didn't have is that nine-tenths of these problems are organizational, not technical. Um, but I'm a, I'm a technology consultant, not a business consultant. <laughs> and it, sometimes that's hard, easier or harder for me to keep in mind, but it's true. So you do need the organization. Um, now, one reason to have this kind of like view to the future is if you know it's going to take you a year to convince your organization to do X, you probably need to start, make sure you know what X is a year early. And you know, one of the jobs as a senior technologist is that kind of very slow pushing on the giant wall trying to move it forward. So, yes sir. You know, I, I, I will never argue with somebody doing doing better than they absolutely need to, you know. So yes sir, way back there. Well uh, uh, by wh which which particular product do you mean by AWS native replication? Because by um, PG logical because um, I want to make sure I'm answering the right question. So um, AWS native replication is which product? You mean DMS? Well, RDS's replication is based on binary replication. So it's a whole different, it's, it's, it's um, based on binary streaming replication. It's actually based on Wally -E, um, uh, also because it uses S3 for um, storage. So they're really different animals. Um, my, my general advice for PG logical versus um, in core logical replication is as long as you can use in core logical replication, use in core logical replication. Otherwise, use PG logical. Um, just because it's always nicer not to have to use an extension if you don't need to. Um, there's nothing wrong with PG logical, just to be clear, it works fine. Um, now, that, uh, now that Amazon supports logical replication, you know, PG logical and, and in core, you can do fun things with that. But they, they saw they're, they're different te technologies that solve different problems. So, and, D and DMS is not a, a good replication solution except for a one-time migration. So, and even Amazon says that. That's not just my opinion. Yes, there was a hand. It's based on, it use, it, it's logical replication. It's a logical decoding consumer on Postgres. Um, but it, there are like types it doesn't support, like timestamp TZ. Yeah, so, um, and this is, again, it's, it's intended as a cross-product migration tool, not a, not, um, and so it's not really super suitable as a ongoing, cons uh, ongoing migration thing for Postgres. Yes, sir.
actually the session is coming back from last week last week. Right? So that's what the prop was saying about uh, who's good to come back from last week. Yeah. So um, the other thing I would recommend on the back end is if you have any kind of down uh, down period of your your subscription or bill, like we send, it can be very very helpful to do an auto batching that does that to get it run a quarter wide. You know, way back when I used to recommend, you know, if you have kind of the sort of standard sinusoidal access patterns, you know, where things are really busy at peak times and really slack at other times, um, either, tr you know, doing, turning loose vacuum on that kind of thing. And I still do recommend that. The problem is these sinusoidal patterns are slowly going away and everyone's all busy all the time now. Um, so <laughs> it's becoming less, of, there's, there are fewer downtime windows, but if you can do it, by all means do it. And you're, and especially on very large databases especially very large insert heavy databases or insert or update. Yes, sir. Well, um, yeah, uh, it depends, um, depends on, on your actual underlying hardware. But if you're on highly virtualized hardware, like say EBS, I will generally set sequential page cost to one and, and random page cost to 1.1. Well, 1.1 is slightly higher. <laughs> Maybe, uh, you know, play with it with your workload. I mean, you know, what you're ultimately trying to do is get the right balance between sequential scans and index scans, ultimately. You know, that's, that's really what, what you're trying to do. And you, you're, you're, your query load knows best there. Great. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>